All right. Uh, I know that the, the previous lecture was really exhausting and there are a lot of facts, etc. But I promise that in this lecture, there will be virtually no new facts that you will need to learn. It's all about understanding the principles behind it. Okay, there will be a little bit of new terminology, about four new words maybe, and that's about it. The rest of it is based on what you already know, and it's just about connecting the dots, all right? So what we'll talk about is a general analysis or general principles of how various substances, how various ligands bind to receptors. What determines how well they bind or how we can measure how well they bind and also what kind of different effects they may have once they have bound, uh, once they are bound to the receptor. Okay, so it's all going to be just analyzing the binding. Now, how can we determine, why is it important? Well, if you develop a new drug or you want to develop a new drug, you need to find out whether it binds to the receptor that you're interested in, right? You, if, if you develop a drug that you want to interfere with nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, you don't really want it to bind to any other, ideally to any other receptor, because you want it very, very specifically binding just to one type or subtype of receptor. So it's important when you develop a new drug to measure, maybe you're not going to measure all the different receptors because there are thousands of them in total, so you're not going to measure all of them, but at least to the ones that you know could cause some significant side effects or something, you're going to measure whether they, this new substance binds to them. So how does that work? Well, now there are all sorts of methods for that, but I will tell you how it used to be done, and, and to some extent it still is. Uh, so what used to be done is, is to take the, the tissue, which you know contains this specific receptor, that you're interested in. Of course, it also contains many other receptors, but let's say we can purify it or there's a high abundance of one specific receptor that you're interested in. You take the tissue and you homogenize it. You basically just put it in a mixer and make a, a goo out of it, okay? Then you can remove all the, the rest of the cells because you're not interested in the rest of the cell. You're only interested in the receptors and you keep the membranes. Okay. Oftentimes this was done with brain, so you would take a brain from a rat, you just kind of make it into a, a goo, um, spin it down, wash it, and you remain, what, what remains are the cell membranes with all the proteins, with all the receptors bound to it. Okay. And that's your preparation that you're going to work with. Now you're going to start adding different amounts, different concentrations of your new substance, or old, doesn't matter, which, is radio, which has been radioactively labeled. So you label it with the radioactive isotope. And you add a little bit of it, of the new substance. You mix it up, you let it sit for a little bit, and then you wash it and you spin it down, you centrifuge it, and you measure the amount of radioactivity which is associated with the membranes. And that's the amount of your substance which is bound to the receptors that you're interested in. Does it make sense? So you can then have a graph having the concentration of the ligand and the binding, the amount of radioactivity which is stuck to the membranes. Okay, the rest of it is gonna be in the solution, but you're interested in how much is stuck in the membranes. So you start with a certain concentration of the ligand, then you increase the concentration of the ligand, you get another time, time point, and you go on and on and on. And that gives you a curve which describes the affinity of the new substance to the receptor that you're interested in. Does this make sense, what I just described? Does it make sense? Hmm? B is binding, okay? So how much of the substance is bound? For example, the amount of radioactivity, okay? Yeah, it gives you, the, the curve that you get gives you some idea about how strongly that's probably a bad word because it's not really about strength of the binding, but the affinity between the new substance and the receptor, okay? This is important because of course, if you're developing a new drug, you not only want it to be as specific for the receptor as you can, but also you want it to have as high affinity 
as possible because then you can use a very low dose, right? If the affinity is very large, you can use only very little and it will occupy all the receptors and thus produce the maximum effect, in theory at least, okay? There might be some reasons why you want to develop actually a drug which does not have a high affinity, but generally you want a high affinity. Okay, so this is the experiment that we would normally do. Now, if we want to analyze it mathematically, what describes the affinity when, we're, when we have a, a binding of a ligand to a receptor can be deduced from seeing the binding as a normal chemical reaction. Okay, so we have a free receptor or a set of free receptors. We have free ligands, our new medication or what have you. And these two can reversibly associate and disassociate to form receptor ligand complex, which basically just means that the new substance is bound to the receptor. Okay? This will go to and fro, and in the end, it will reach an equilibrium. And at this equilibrium, there will be a certain number of free receptors, a certain number of free ligand molecules, and a certain number of receptor ligand complex, right? To your question? No? Okay. Uh, which parameter will describe this equilibrium? Again, generally, that's true for it. Hmm? The concentration of the enzyme substrate complex? But that also depends on how much stuff you added in, right? It's not just... Hmm? Not really. Michaelis constant is for enzyme kinetics. But some constant will describe the equilibrium, right? The equilibrium constant, right? The equilibrium constant tells us basically the ratio of the products through the reactants, right? Yep. Okay. So we can, we can construct an equilibrium constant. And here, we're actually going to look at the reaction going in the opposite direction. I'll explain that. If we took the equilibrium constant for this reaction, it would be called the association constant, okay? And it would be equal to RL divided by R times L. Yeah? That's a very general description of the equilibrium constant. Yeah, just nod your head if that's something. Don't nod your head just because I tell you, but nod your head if you, if you, if you really understand what I just drew. This should be something that's been covered in quite some detail before. Yeah, equilibrium constant. Good. However, in pharmacology, we use the opposite of that. So we look at the reaction going in the opposite direction. It's the same thing, we just turn it around, okay? So we use a dissociation constant, which is just one over this. So that's gonna be equal to R times L divided by RL. Same thing, just swapped around, okay? And by convention, this is the one that's used, but it could be the other one as well. So this is the expression that tells us, and it's basically the KD, that tells us something about the affinity of the bond or of the binding of the ligand to the complex, uh, sorry, to the receptor to form the complex. Because of course, the more of the complex there is at a given concentration, the higher the affinity, right? Now, how can we measure, how can we determine KD? Because that tells us that's the real parameter for affinity, right? That's, that's the thing that we're interested in. So how can we measure it? Now, we're going to measure it using this experiment, basically. Okay? That's why I started with this experiment. But how can we link the experiment that we, did, that we performed here and the data that we get from it, how can we link it to this expression? So here we have ligand concentration. Here we have also ligand concentration. That's easy, right? But what about the other variables? How are they related to the variables that we measured there? Isn't the 
No? Very good. So the first substitution here is that indeed binding is equal to RL because that's the number of receptors that are occupied by the ligand. In other words, it's the amount of radioactivity that we end up with when we spin the whole thing down and we're just left with the membranes, right? So indeed, B is equal to RL. Good. So this is sorted, this is sorted. What about R? So that's the equilibrium number of free receptors. How can we measure that? Okay, can you explain that? Can you just speak up so that everybody here? Mm -hmm. And the ligands will, there's only a certain number of ligands that will bind to these receptors. So okay. Maximum binding is not as So you're right that we start with the maximum binding. So basically, we carry on this experiment, we keep increasing the amount of ligand, and at some point, no more ligand is going to bind, right? We'll get it to a maximum amount of radioactivity and after that no more will be bound. So we can take that as B max. But what then? Is B max equal to something here? RL. No, just R. Can't be equal to RL because that's equal to B. Very good. B max is equal to R plus RL. Because at any point in the experiment, the total number of receptors, we don't know the total number of receptors, okay? We don't know how, mu how many receptors there are in our preparation. We don't know that. But at any point, the sum of free receptors plus the occupied receptors has to be the total number of receptors, right? And when all of them are occupied, then B max is equal to the total number of receptors. Okay, so B max is indeed equal to R plus RL. Yes? But uh, isn't in general the B measuring only the bound receptors in the ligand? Yes. So why it's not only RL? So, B max is equal to RL only here. But it's equal to R plus RL at every point. So the amount of R goes down and the amount of RL goes up and the sum is always equal to B max. In the end, there's going to be zero R and everything is going to be RL. In that case, it's going to be equal to B max. You're right. But at any point, it's equal to R plus RL. Okay? Yeah, that may have confused everyone else, but hopefully it makes sense to you. All right, so now we can plug everything into this expression and connect the two together. So what will it look like? So we'll have KD is equal to, L stays the same, right? No need, no need to change that. RL, is equal to B. And what is R equal to? B max minus B. B max minus B. Okay, I'll show it here. Yeah, because B is equal to RL. So B max minus B is equal to R. Yeah, Yeah. this is relatively simple algebra. Just moving things around. This is equal to B, so we put this in and then we just subtract the two, all right? Good, so here we'll have B max minus B. All right, well, now we want to probably move it around a little bit because in the end, we would like to have an equation that describes this relationship, because this is what we're in the end interested in. Of course, in order to calculate KD, we have everything that we need, okay? But we can rearrange it to give us this relationship between L and B, which is interesting because that describes how much of the stuff will be bound at any point. 
So let's rearrange that. Let's multiply both sides by B. Yeah, and in order to make it quicker, or do you not want me to do it quicker? Do you want me to go step by step? Okay, so we can also multiply this and that at the, in one step, all right? So what we get is KD times B is equal to B max times L minus uh, B times L. Yep. Should be pretty straightforward. Okay, now we can move this all the way here. Okay, and we can take the B, which is going to be the same in both of them, and put it in front of a bracket. All right, so what we get from that is going to be B times KD plus L is equal to B max times L. Just say if it's too quick and I can do it a little bit more slowly. Is it fine? Do you see what I did there? I did two things in one go, okay? That makes it maybe a little bit more complicated, but... Okay? And then we can just take this whole bracket, sorry, we can just take this whole bracket and divide the whole thing by the bracket. And what do we end up with is B is equal to B max times L divided by KD plus L. This hopefully should be familiar to you, this expression. Because it's actually very similar to michaelis menten model of enzyme kinetics. Only instead of Vmax, we have Bmax. Instead of V, we have, we have B, all right? And this is no coincidence that we get the same expression because this is exactly how the michaelis menten model is derived. It really starts with the equilibrium constant and that's how the whole thing is derived, okay? Only there we expect that once the substrate binds, the reaction occurs, okay? Which is, it's not necessarily true, but this is what the model expects. Here, we don't care yet what happens afterwards, okay? If something is activated, we're only interested in the binding. But in the end, the mathematics behind it and the logic behind it is exactly the same as for the michaelis menten kinetics, okay? So now you can forget the michaelis menten equation and you can always derive it from the equilibrium constant if you want. All right, so <coughs> this is the mathematics for describing the binding. Pretty simple, it behaves the same way as enzyme kinetics even though we are actually measuring slightly different things. All right, now I said that at this point we were not interested in the effect but now we're actually moving towards being interested in the effect because what, you know, why would we need something to bind to a receptor if it doesn't do anything interesting, right? So we want to see what the binding of the ligand actually causes in these, uh, in these receptors. And the mechanisms you already know, okay? So there are all sorts of ionotropic, metabotropic receptors, et cetera, et cetera. However, we can use a similar analysis for the effect, okay? But before we get there, now I have to tell you the four different terminology terms that I need you to, to know. And after that, we basically know everything that we need to know and we'll just play around with some graphs and, and see whether we under, all understand it correctly. So, based on the effect on the receptor, we can divide all ligands into four groups. The first group are going to be agonists. And agonists are ligands that bind to a receptor and activate it. Okay? Pretty simple, yeah? 
Yes? Uh, we have uh, the name which has its constant for enzyme substrate equation. Yep. Is there a specific name for this one? Or it's called dissociation constant. It's still the same dissociation constant that we started with. Oh, right. but no okay. Specific. In the kinetics, it's different because we're measuring actually the rate of reaction, and therefore the, the constant that we get there is a different constant. But here it's dissociation constant. We didn't add anything, we didn't, it's just dissociation constant. Okay? So we have agonists. Then we have ligands that bind to receptor and do nothing. Do absolutely nothing. They are called antagonists. Why are they useful if they do nothing? Well, they're useful because generally they block the effect of the agonist by one way or another, okay? So that's why antagonists are useful because they disable the agonist from binding or from having an effect, okay? So in pharmacology, very often we use antagonists for some receptors or, or, or et cetera. The third category are partial agonists. Partial agonists. Now, what does it mean that, that we can have a partial agonist? Well, basically, it's, it's a ligand that binds to the receptor, activates it, but activates it less than the full agonist. So in, in theory, actually, correctly, I should put here full agonist and then partial agonist. So you can imagine the, the, the example that I usually use is when we have an ion channel, an ionotropic receptor, it doesn't really work in reality that when a ligand comes, the closed channel becomes open and stays open, and then when the ligand leaves, the channel closes. It doesn't really work like that at all, okay? Even though we may have been telling you that, but that's not true, okay? What actually happens is that the channel, even without an agonist, without anything bound to it, constantly fluctuates between open and closed, just randomly, because it's a molecule, right? There's a, basically, you could say, a Brownian motion within the molecule. So the molecule just move, moves constantly. And the probability of it being in the open state versus the probability of it being in the closed state is what changes with binding of the agonist. So it, it just opens, closes, opens, closes. When, when an agonist binds, the probability that it will be open increases massively, so it spends much more time in the open configuration. And when the agonist leaves, it actually goes, goes back to the low probability of being open. So therefore you can see that we can just change the probability not from zero to 100%, but we can have it just 50%, okay? So the probability of it opening will increase, but not as much as it could increase with the full agonist. So this is how par partial agonists work, yeah? So they activate the enzyme, they bind to it, but they don't have the full potency of the full agonist. They can have 50%, 75%, 10%, for example, potency, okay? It is not directly related to affinity. Just be aware that affinity and effect are two separate things. So we can imagine to have a partial agonist that has a very, very high affinity for the receptor. So it really, really wants to bind to the receptor, but will only activate it to 50%. Then we can have a full agonist that has a relatively low affinity to the receptor, so it will bind, but not so much. But it will, when it does bind, it will activate it to 100%. Okay? So these two things are not related. Well, they are related, but they are not the same thing. Yes? I mean, that's the definition of the full agonist. The full agonists give you the full the response. Okay? Of course, in reality, we never know what the full response is, okay? So it's possible that we could come up with an even fuller agonist than the full agonist that we have in theory, okay? So it's usually defined by having an agonist that we know is, is, is a pretty good agonist. Oftentimes, it's the natural agonist. So for glutamatergic receptors, glutamate is considered a full agonist. And then we can have partial agonists that have lower potency than that, okay? But by definition, full agonist has 100% response the maximum response that it, it can have, basically, once it binds to the receptor. Make sense? All right. And the last category are inverse agonists. 
and inverse agonists produce the negative, the opposite effect than the agonists. So once again, if we have the ion channel that opens and closes all the time and just changes probability, we can imagine that without any ligand bound to it, there is a probability, let's say, of 10% that it is open, okay? Without any ligand bound to it. When we bind a full agonist, the probability rises to 99% of being open. When we add an inverse agonist, the probability drops to 1%. So that's an inverse agonist. Because antagonist will just keep it at 10%. It will do nothing to the probability. Antagonist just does nothing at all. Okay? An inverse agonist actually produces an opposite response. Okay? Good. The final piece of the puzzle, and a very tiny one, is that in the same way as we analyzed binding using this, this equation, we can also analyze effect. So the, the relationship between the amount of ligand added and the effect. And for that, we use a formula which is very, very similar. Only we start at effect because we start with effect, not binding. This time we're not interested in binding, we're interested in effect. And that is equal to E max, which is the maximum effect, times the concentration of ligand, divided by EC50 plus the, plus the concentration of ligand. It's the same, I mean, superficially, it's the same formula as for binding. EC50 is a parameter that describes how much of the effect is produced by a certain concentration of ligand. In fact, it is the concentration of ligand, and this will again be familiar to you, is the concentration of ligand that produces 50% of the maximum effect. Again, similar thing to Michaelis constant, okay? So EC50 is the amount, the concentration of ligand, which produces half maximum effect. In fact, we could do exactly the same experiment as we did with binding, but this time, we would not be measuring binding to whatever membranes or what have you, but we would actually be measuring the desired effect. So for example, you can imagine that we have a, uh, a piece of, let's say, aorta or something, okay, some blood vessel. And we're interested, we're trying to measure its contraction. We're interested in a molecule that causes contraction of the smooth muscles and vasoconstriction of the, of the blood vessel, right? So we add a little bit of the, of the ligand, and the diameter of the blood vessel becomes smaller. Okay, so we put first point. Okay, then we add more, it becomes even smaller. And so we go up and up and up until it's so small that it can't contract anymore, and that's gonna be our maximum effect, right? And then we can go and take half maximal, so this would be E max over two, and here's going to be our EC50. Okay, so it's the equivalent of KD, but it's not really, it's a different thing. Hopefully it will become clear why these things are different in a second when we start drawing the various graphs of the various situations, yes? Um, including a previous example with the binding group, do we always keep in mind that if we have an X amount of receptors and we have an amount of light ligands that are, is, surpasses a number of receptors, the effectiveness, if you want to call it, of the receptors will be 100%. So they will always, all the available ligands will bind 100% to them? Well, it, of course it's in, uh, I think you're asking two questions. One is, if we have an infinite amount of ligand, are all the receptors going to be occupied with a ligand? Yeah. The answer to that is, of course, that's the whole idea, okay? We get maximum binding. The other question you're asking, if we have an infinite amount of ligand, is there gonna be 100% effect? Well, that's not necessarily true, because if our ligand is an antagonist, then there will be no effect. Even at full occupancy of all the receptors, there will be no effect. If it's a partial agonist, maybe there's gonna be submaximal effect. If it's an inverse agonist, then we're gonna have the maximum negative effect. Mm 
So binding is necessary for the effect, but it's not sufficient. We also need the ligand to have a potency, to have an effect, okay? And if it's an antagonist, there's zero potency. It doesn't produce an effect, okay? But again, it will become clear when, once you start drawing the various graphs of what goes on, hopefully. Do you have any questions at this point? Because this is, this is it. There is no more theory now. Now you should have everything that you're going to need to construct all the various situations. So for example, if we start adding an antagonist, what kind of binding, what kind of effect is that going to be? If we mix an agonist and an antagonist, what kind of effect that there's going to be and what kind of binding? That's what we're going to do in the rest of the lecture. Yes? So can you just explain Yeah, that's by definition, basically, okay? So we just did this experiment, but this time we didn't measure binding, but we measured effect. And we get actually a very similar curve as we got with binding. And we can analyze it in exactly the same way because this is the relationship between them. So here we define, it's, it's actually a parameter that defines the whole thing. The same way as in enzyme kinetics, we have Michaelis constant, which is defined as the amount of substrate, the concentration of substrate that gives us half maximal rate of reaction. Here, EC50 is the concentration of ligand, which gives us half maximal response. Okay, it's a parameter of the curve. It's a mathematical parameter that describes the curve. Yes? So, for example, like, when we measure the amount of the base constriction, do we assume that, like, for example, during these measures, the agonist has an opposite effect? If we're measuring vasoconstriction and we edit an inverse agonist, the inverse agonist would cause vasodilation. So we'd be going into minus, minus contraction. Was, was that your question? Yeah. Other questions to this analysis? Because once you understand this, and now we have time to really make sure that everybody understands, then you won't have to learn it. Because once you understand it, it's there. And you can use it whenever, and you won't have to learn it. OK? So, if you don't understand it, do ask questions now because we do have a bit of time now. Is it clear? Okay, well, we'll see in a second. All right. Uh, let's take a five minute break. And after that, we're going to start just playing around with this and constructing various scenarios. Any more acute questions? I'm sure there will be plenty more questions coming once we start looking at it uh, in detail. So, all right. So what I want to do now is to try and apply the, the theory that we just covered to specific situations. And what I always want to do is to draw a graph for binding and then to draw a graph for effect. So hopefully this will highlight the connection between the two. Because they are not the same thing as we hopefully made clear. Okay, so we'll draw these two graphs for all sorts of different situations now. At any point, if it's not clear why it works like that, please ask, okay? Now is the time to ask. If you don't ask here, you may really struggle or you may have to, I don't know, ask your friends or read a lot about it or something. It's not the best way, okay? So if, it's, if something is not clear, now we really do have time to go into it and explain it again, okay? So use the time. All right, so we'll start with a simple binding graph and simple effect graph of a full agonist. We start with the simplest thing, the full agonist, okay? So we get some kind of a binding like so, and some kind of an effect like this, all right? Here is maximum binding, and here is KD. Here is maximum effect, and here is EC50. This should be hopefully be clear because this is just what 
this is exactly what we just covered, okay? Simple iconist, good. Now what happens if instead of an agonist, we do this experiment with an antagonist? And let's imagine that the antagonist has the same KD as the agonist, okay? Just to simplify it, okay? It's gonna have the same KD as the agonist, but it's an antagonist. So, using the red chalk, what will the binding curve look like? We have an antagonist with the same KD. It's gonna be the same, no, it's gonna be the same, okay? The binding is gonna be exactly the same because the binding curve only depends on the affinity which is described by KD, okay? It has nothing to do with the effect. It doesn't really matter what kind of effect the thing has, the ligand has. The only thing that determines the binding curve is this parameter, okay? I mean, of course, the, the, the Bmax as well, but that's, we're not interested in that, right? So if it has the same KD, in the same setting, it's gonna have the same binding curve, right? Just nod your head if this is something that makes sense. Same curve. What is the curve gonna look like for the effect? Zero effect. No matter how much we add, there is no effect because it's an antagonist, right? It binds, it binds all the way to maximum binding, but it produces no effect because it's an antagonist, right? Okay? So we're only binding the antagonist, okay? And the definition of an antagonist is that it produces no effect. No matter how much there is, it, it does nothing. It just binds, okay, and produces nothing. So there's gonna be zero effect, no matter how much of it we add, because it produces no effect, okay? Here we're not mixing agonist and antagonist. That will happen later, okay? Here we're just using a single molecule, okay? Good. Now. Let's imagine that we have a partial agonist. Let's say a partial agonist that has 50% potency, okay, compared to the full agonist, and it has, it has the same KD. So it's the same affinity to the receptor, but half the potency. It's a partial agonist. Clear what we're we doing now? Partial agonist, 50% potency, same affinity. What will the binding look like? Be the same. What will the effect look like? All right, so in the simplest model that we just described, we would get a curve that would end at 50% Emax, right? Because there's a 50% potency, all right? Now, this would only be true Okay, just draw it or write down because now I have to explain something which is a little bit complicated. This would only be true if in order to get 100%, okay, oh. Because it's, this is important, if you miss it, you will miss a very, very important part of the whole thing, all right? So this would only be true if for the maximum effect, we need to have 100% of receptors occupied. I'll say that again. If we are in a system where we have to occupy, by an agonist, when we have to occupy all the receptors available, then this would be true. Because at this point, all the receptors are occupied by our 50% agonist, 50% potency agonist, partial agonist, and therefore the effect is only 50%. Okay, it makes perfect sense. However, in real life, this is almost never true. Most cells, organs, tissues, whatever, have far more receptors than they need activated in order to produce 100% response. In many cells, in many tissues, only 10% occupancy of those receptors can produce 100% effect, okay? Because there are various methods of amplifying the, the signal, 
for example, in a G protein coupled receptor, and you know that when the receptor is activated, it can activate several different molecules of G proteins. Then each of the alpha subunits can activate usually one or more uh, adenylate cyclases. Each adenylate cyclase can then activate or turn many molecules of ATP to CAMP, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a massive amplification. And in, in the end, we don't have to occupy and activate all the receptors in order to get 100% response. So even though this is perfectly, and you derived it absolutely correctly from the theory, in reality, it is possible, it's not guaranteed, but it is possible that even with a partial agonist, in the end, we can get to Emax. We will probably need a higher concentration. So at any point in the curve, the effect is going to be lower than in the case of the full agonist. But it's possible, it's not guaranteed, but it's possible under certain conditions to reach the Emax. Now this phenomenon that we don't need to occupy to activate all the receptors to get 100% response is called a phenomenon of spare receptors. So that means that most cells have spare receptors. In other words, we don't have to activate all of them in order to get 100% response. And this fact, which again, in reality is almost always there, complicates a little bit these models because if we don't have to activate all the receptors, even with 50% effect, in the end, if we occupy enough of those receptors with 50% effect, we can get 100% effect in the whole cell. Does it make sense? Okay, in the case of ion channels, let's say we open them to 50% probability of opening, but, so with a full agonist, which opens them to 100%, we only need 10 receptors to be open, and we get the full effect, enough to depolarize the membrane. With a 50% partial agonist, we have to open 20 channels in order to get the 100% effect, okay? Because the effect is only 50% 50, 50 of that. So under certain conditions with spare receptors present, it is possible even with partial agonist to reach 100% effect, okay? But maybe it won't, maybe it will. It depends on the specifics, okay? On the affinities, et cetera, et cetera. Good. The final situation is that we have an inverse agonist, just an inverse agonist, which has, which has the same affinity as the full agonist to the, to the uh, receptor. So what will the binding curve look like? It will be the same, indeed. What will the effect curve look like? Yes, indeed. It will look something like this. Okay, so we get the opposite effect. Now, the shape of the curve will depend on the potency of the inverse agonist. Okay, so it will depend whether it's a full inverse agonist, so to speak, or a partial inverse agonist. Usually, it's not full uh, inverse agonist, so it, it won't give you exactly the same thing, only negative. It's usually much, much smaller, so it's usually partial agonist. But let's not, let's not worry about that now. All right, good. So is this all understood, or are there bits that you're a little bit unclear about? Yeah? The 50%? The EC50. Yeah, I mean, the EC50 will definitely, be, uh, will definitely be higher for the partial agonist. But here, and hopefully it's not going to complicate it too much, here we always compare it to the Emax of the full agonist. So unlike for enzyme inhibition, where in the case of inhibition, we would actually take the new Emax and then take half of that, here we always compare it to the full agonist. So of course, we will need much more of the partial agonist to give us 50% response of the, of the full agonist. So yes, yeah. 
If that doesn't make a lot of sense, it doesn't really matter, I think. Yeah? You said like 10% of the receptors might be enough. Yeah. So shouldn't like the index be rich rather than the beginning? Like you said 10% is enough. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yes, that's a possibility. Okay, so if we assume that only, that there are 90% spare receptors in this specific system, and we assume that the two axes have the same scale, then you're right. In theory, in that case, with the spare receptors, the curve should probably look like this. Okay, yes, that's true. Okay, but we don't know. We, we, we don't know if there are spare receptors, we don't know how many of them are there, et cetera, because there are, there are many variables that will define the, the curve. But yes, you're right, you understand it correctly. Any more questions? Yeah? If the binding? If the KD of all these ligands is the same, then all of them will bind exactly the same. Because the only thing that determines binding is the KD. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand that. If we have an antagonist and we mix it with agonist, or we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. So this is the simplest situation, or the simplest situation. Are they clear? So that we can move on to the more complicated ones? All right. We're going to use the same graphs. But now we're going to have a slightly different experiment. What we're gonna do now is that before we start adding our full agonist, so we're gonna be, all these, all these experiments are gonna be done with the full agonist. We're gonna be increasing the concentration of the full agonist. However, before we do that, we add a certain fixed amount of something else. Okay, so to start with, to our test tube, we add some, something, an antagonist, partial agonist, or inverse agonist, and then we start adding the full agonist. Make sense? All right. So what will the binding of the full agonist look like? So this is in the absence of anything, okay? This is just our standard curve that we start with. What will the binding of the full agonist look like if in the beginning, we added a fixed concentration of an antagonist. The same blood. No. Oh, no, no, no. It will cancel the, like, Yeah, well. Okay, so it's gonna be lower, probably. Or no effect. No. It's antagonist. No. It's antagonist. It disables agonists. So, oh, then it's competitive. Uh, <laughs> so, in order to answer this question, what the binding will look like of the agonist in the presence of an antagonist, which we added in the beginning, depends on whether the antagonist is competitive or non competitive. Okay? If the agonist, and that's the, sim that's the simpler situation, if the agonist with respect to the antagonist or the antagonist with respect to the agonist are competitive, they compete with each other for binding to the same place, the binding curve will look like what? It will be lower, yes. It will be lower in both cases. It depends how much we add. Not really. In the case of competitive, it doesn't really very good, okay? So we'll be lower, but in the end, we will reach Bmax, okay? Because the two compete for the same binding site, so in the end, as we add more and more of the full agonist, it will displace all the antagonists from the binding site, and we'll get 
maximum binding. Okay? Now, if the antagonist is non-competitive, one possibility is that the binding doesn't change. And I'll probably use some other diagram to describe that, all right? Because this is a little bit complicated to, to see how that works. So this is our receptor, ion channel, whatever. Uh, the first case that we just drew was that the full agonist and the competitive antagonist compete for the same binding site, okay? That's what we just drew there, okay? So in the end, we get full binding, maximum binding, but the whole time it's gonna be lower than the full agonist binding. Yeah, hopefully that's clear. Now with the non-competitive antagonist, there are again two possibilities. One is that the non-competitive antagonist has absolutely no effect on the binding of the full agonist. So if, for example, it binds somewhere here, it only blocks the channel from opening. In that case, is it clear, the situation? Okay, so let's imagine that the non-competitive antagonist is an allosteric antagonist that binds somewhere here, completely unrelated to the binding of the agonist, only it prevents, by its binding, it prevents the channel from opening. For example, it can be blocking the channel or something. Okay? In that case, the binding of the agonist is going to be the same, right? There will be no effect on the binding. It's gonna be the same. We'll, we'll get to the effects, okay? Because actually the effects are, right, anyway, we'll get, we'll get to that, okay? However, there is a possibility of having a non-competitive antagonist which does interfere with the binding of the ligand. For example, you can imagine that it binds here, it's allosteric, but it actually influences, it changes the conformation of the binding site and therefore the normal agonist cannot bind properly. Okay? So they're not competing, they're not binding to the same place, but it is changing the conformation so that the, the normal ligand cannot bind. Okay? In that case, what will the curve look like? Sorry? Yes, okay. So we won't reach B max, or the B max is going to be decreased, okay? Because at any point, some of the receptors will be occupied by this non competitive antagonist and will not allow the, the, the agonist to bind. Is this clear? The possibilities? Yeah? Uh, the allosteric thing is a little bit confusing. It can be allosteric, but I was just going to tell you that it can also not be allosteric. So allosteric just means that it binds to a different place than where the agonist binds. Okay, so this is what I drew here was an allosteric antagonist. Okay. However, yes? Oh, well, I'm, I'm drawing in blue what happens to the binding of the normal agonist in the presence of the antagonist. So we're only, we're only looking at the binding of the agonist this time, okay? So it's always about the agonist, okay? Even though I'm using different colors. What is the difference between the two lines? Well, there are three, in fact, there. Uh, okay. This is a competitive, normal competitive antagonist. Nothing difficult there, okay? This would be a non-competitive antagonist which does not interfere with binding of the agonist. So therefore the binding of the agonist is gonna be the same. Here is a non-competitive antagonist which does interfere with binding of the full agonist. In that case, the binding will look like this. Now why do I add this weird situation where the antagonist actually interferes with binding? Well, this is what the curve will look like if we use an irreversible antagonist. If we use a molecule that actually binds to the same player as the agonist, but once it's bound there, it stays there and does not allow the agonist to come in. That's why I didn't want to say that it's allosteric, because in this case it's not an allosteric inhibitor. It will look like a non-competitive inhibitor, 
sorry, an non-competitive antagonist. But it actually binds to the same place as the normal agonist, and it will interfere with its binding. So an irreversible competitive antagonist will look non-competitive. Okay, so we're talking about this curve. We're talking about a non-competitive antagonist which interferes with binding of the full agonist, okay? One possibility is that it's an allosteric antagonist which binds somewhere else and changes the conformation in such a way that the normal agonist cannot bind. That's one possibility. The other possibility, which will look exactly the same, is that we have an antagonist that binds to the same play as the agonist, but it's irreversible. So once it's there, it just stays there and blocks the binding of the agonist. The curve will look exactly the same. We can't distinguish between the two possibilities. Well, we would have to do some other experiments for that. Okay? Yes, there's basically four situations, but two of them will look the same based on the curve. So the one that uh, makes the binding uh, decrease and either be on an allosteric phase, but also on the receptor? But then it has to be irreversible. No, because the competitiveness is only derived from these curves. This is, this is competitive and this is non-competitive. I know what you mean. It looks like it will compete for the binding, but it's not a competitive inhibitor because it has a different curve. Whether in, sorry, I'm saying inhibitor because it's the same for enzymes, but the, the, the thing that makes an antagonist competitive is what the curve looks like. Basically, competitive is whatever where by increasing the ligand concentration enough, we will in the end displace it from the binding and we will get to, e, to, to B max. That's competitive. That's the definition of competitive. Okay? If we can displace it with enough ligand, it's competitive. But here we can't displace it because it's irreversible. It's irreversibly bound there. So it behaves as a non-competitive antagonist, even though, in fact, it does compete for the binding but it's a non-competitive one because we can't displace it by adding enough ligand. Yep. Yeah, I know it's a bit confusing, but yeah. So is this the same as the abortion pill? Uh, which abortion pill? Yeah, I think those are competitive antagonists. I'm pretty sure they're competitive antagonists. They're actually, in pharmacology, there aren't that many non... Well, there are some non-competitive... Well, actually, there are some non-competitive... But I, I think the progesterone antagonist is a, is a competitive one. I'm not 100% sure, but I think so. Anyway, now, th this is the most difficult bit. The rest of it is simple. This is the most difficult bit, okay? What will the effect look like for all these four situations that we just described? What is the effect going to look like for a normal competitive antagonist? It will be slower, but it still will be. Indeed. Okay? Will rise more slowly, but in the end it will reach Emax. Super simple. Okay? What will the curve look like for a non competitive antagonist? And in this case, we can actually combine all the non-competitive antagonists together because there is no difference between them with respect to effect. Okay? They will all behave the same way. What will the curve look like for a non-competitive antagonist? Will not reach enough. Hmm? Okay. So we can imagine a curve where it doesn't reach Emax. Why doesn't it reach Emax? Because at any point, some of the receptors are going to be occupied by the antagonist, which blocks the effect of the agonist, therefore we won't have the maximum effect. However, if there are spare receptors, then it might reach the maximum effect. Because we added a certain fixed amount of the antagonist, which occupied, let's say, 50% of all the receptors. Okay, So 50% of all the available receptors are forever occupied by this non-competitive antagonist. Okay, 
However, if we can activate the, the remaining 50% and it's enough to produce 100% effect, then we'll get to 100% effect, even in the presence of a non-competitive inhibitor. Make sense? So how does it actually do a function since there's like a time zone? Since, since there can be an effect even though there are the antagonists? Well, at any point, the curve is going to be lower. Yeah. So the antagonist will decrease at any point it will be lower. So this is what we usually use in pharmacology or pharmacotherapy, okay? We want to decrease the effect, which is true. However, in certain situations, we may still get, if there is a ton of the full agonist, which biologically rarely happens, right? We almost never have so much of the full agonist that it will just override everything. So these are more just theoretical possibilities, okay? But in theory, if there are spare receptors and we haven't really occupied enough of the receptors, we can, in theory, get to the maximum effect. Okay, it may not happen, but it might, depending on the specifics. Yes? When an uh, agonist binds, so allosteric antagonist can bind as well? When an allosteric antagonist binds? No, the opposite. If an uh, agonist then bound, so uh -huh. So if the agonist is bound, yeah. can the allosteric one bound? Generally, yes, but again, it depends on the specifics. Okay, it's, po it's also a poss possibility, well, let me think about that. I think generally, generally the binding of the agonist does not really influence the binding of the antagonist, but theoretically, it's possible that they do influence each other, but they would really complicate the models, I think, but it's, it's a possibility, yes. So is it clear how these antagonists, as I say, this is the most difficult bit. The rest of it is pretty simple. Yeah? You said we can have the same effect for all the non-competitive antagonists. Yes. Is it also the same for irreversible ones? Yeah, for the irreversible one, it's the same thing. So in the absence of spare receptors, we will never reach Emacs because some of the receptors are occupied by the irreversible antagonist. They will just sit there, okay? But if there are spare receptors, then it's possible that even if we block 50% or whatever, 30%, 70%, I don't know, of the receptors using the irreversible antagonist, the rest of them might still be enough if we activate them to produce 100% effect. Okay. Further questions? I know it's getting a little late in the day, and you already had a very difficult lecture or lectures or seminars before then. But as I said, this, this was the difficult bit, okay? The, the remaining two are simple. Well, I think they are pretty simple. So let's talk about a partial agonist. Same thing, but we're going to have a partial agonist in the beginning. What will the binding look like? In the presence of a partial agonist, the binding of an agonist. It's going to be exactly the same as the antagonist. Because basically what we're doing is we just have two ligands that are in the same place. It doesn't matter if they are antagonists, if they are partial agonists, if they are inverse agonists, right? If we look at the binding, it's basically just two ligands that are in the same place and either compete or not compete. So for a partial agonist, either it can be a competitive partial agonist and then it's going to look like it, the binding is look, look like exactly, uh, sorry, it's going to look exactly like the, uh, the antagonist, competitive, or it can be a non-competitive partial agonist, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, but let's say theoretically there could be one, okay? Partial agonists generally are competitive because they have to bind to the same place, but, you know, who knows, okay? So if it, if it were non-competitive or if it were irreversible, the binding would look like this, Okay? Okay, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to have a partial agonist that would have no effect on the binding of the agonist, but can, can you see how the analysis that we just performed for the antagonist is exactly the same for partial agonists, for anything else, actually even for another agonist. If we had two agonists in the same place, we would have these possibilities as well, okay? Well, mostly they would be probably competitive, right? Because that makes sense. But, but again, theoretically, we could see any of these interferences. Do you, do you agree that the analysis that we did for antagonists apply to any other ligand that is added? 
because the effect doesn't matter, okay, here. It's just about binding. Okay, so any other ligand will produce any of those scenarios. It doesn't matter, it's partial agonist, inverse agonist, what have you. However, the effect curve does matter. There will be differences for the effect curve. So what will the effect look like for the partial agonist? So we add a fixed amount of partial agonist and then we start adding the full agonist. Say again. It will be higher than an antagonist, but lower than a full agonist. That, that I agree with. Okay, no? Uh -huh. I completely agree. I completely agree with that description. But there's one more thing that I want to make sure that you realize in this setting. In the case of partial agonists, we will not start from zero. Because already in the beginning of our experiment, we added a partial agonist, which is a partial agonist. So there will be some effect even at zero concentration of the agonist because we added some partial agonist beforehand. Does it make sense? We won't start from zero because in the beginning we added some partial agonists before we started. So at zero agonist, we already have some concentration of partial agonists which will produce some effect. So we won't start from zero. But as you say, so in this part of the curve, the effect with partial agonists is going to be higher sorry, the effect of the combination of partial agonist and agonist is going to be actually higher than with just agonist. Okay? But then, as we start adding more and more of the full agonist, it will become lower again. I'll explain that again. All right? So this is the curve of just the full agonist, nothing else, the effect. Okay? The, the one in yellow is the combination. So we added some partial agonists in the beginning, and then we start adding the full agonist. In this part of the curve, the effect in the presence of partial agonists is actually higher than if the partial agonist was not present. Why is that? Because we added some agonist already in the beginning. So there is some effect, even though the concentration of the full agonist is still very, very, very low, we do have the effect from the partial agonist. But then, as we add more and more of the full agonist, the two, most likely competitive, will compete with each other for binding. And since the partial agonist has less of an effect, the effect curve here will be lower than the one in the absence of a partial agonist. It will, it will eventually, if they're competitive, which we said that presumably they are, it will eventually reach Emax. But this is a very interesting uh, property of partial agonists. In very low concentrations of the full agonist, the partial agonist produces a higher effect than just the full agonist. In high concentrations of full agonist, the partial agonist will decrease the effect of the full agonist. And this is actually used therapeutically where we want to decrease the, the extremes so we want to prop up a function which normally would be too low, and we want to decrease a function that would be too high. And we can use partial agonists for that because it basically flattens the curve a little bit. Okay? We do have some effect even at zero agonist concentration, and we have a lower effect at very high concentration. So we kind of normalize the extremes. Yep? Um, I will give you an example tomorrow. Okay. Why the partial agonist? Because that's how we carry out the experiment, okay? We said that in the beginning, we add a little bit of partial agonist or antagonist or what have you. And then we start adding from zero, we start adding the full agonist. So here is a zero concentration of the full agonist. 
but the partial agonist is already there, therefore we have some effect there already. Okay, so in, in the combination of agonist, full agonist and partial agonist here in the beginning, there is actually a higher effect than without the partial agonist, and then we have a lower effect as the concentration of the full agonist increases. Okay, now what will the effect look like, well the binding we already know, but what will the binding look like for an inverse agonist? Same possibilities as with the other ones, okay? It's binding, so we don't care that it's an inverse agonist. What will the effect look like for an inverse agonist? Zero. So it will start below the x-axis, okay? Because we already added it in the beginning, so there will be some negative effect to start with. And then what happens? In the beginning, we added an inverse agonist, and then we start adding more and more of the agonist. Now we assume that they are competitive, okay, just to make it easier. So they will, it will start below zero, okay, because it's an inverse agonist that we added in the beginning, so there will be some negative effect already from the very start, right? Yeah? Okay, if you can squeeze out of yourselves the last two minutes of energy, if you understand this, we're done. Okay, that's it. That's the last bit of, of information. Okay? So we start with an inverse agonist, therefore the effect starts below zero because it already produced some negative effect on our preparation or whatever part or what have you in the lab. Okay? But what happens then? We start adding the full agonist. What, what happens? Sure, sure. The amount of inverse agonist is set. It's not gonna change, right? So what we do is we add the full agonist, and since they are competitive, we said that they are competitive. In the end, we also reach v, uh, Emax, okay? But basically, the inverse agonist is, in most places will behave like a competitive antagonist, only there is this negative effect in the beginning. Now, of course, and that's something you can do at home if you're bored and you don't want to watch uh, Game of Thrones or something. Uh, you can also construct these graphs from the other way around. So you can also imagine that you edit in the beginning a certain fixed amount of an agonist, and then you start adding an antagonist or a partial agonist or an inverse agonist. And the curves will, of course, look completely different, right? If we start, if we start with a full agonist, and then we start adding inverse agonist, the curve is gonna look like this, right? Okay? If we start with a full agonist and we starting, start adding a partial agonist, the curve will also look like this and will come to zero at some point or some other, not to zero, sorry, but to some, some value, okay? So uh, I know that this is probably not the most fun activity you can do, but... <laughs> But if you can play around with these things in your head, that means that you really understand the theory behind it. And from the principles that we covered in the beginning, you should be able to, because basically now we know everything that we need to describe any kind of situation, any kind of mixture. No, končíme ve tři, jako normálně. No? Jo? So that means that uh, from the basics that we covered in the beginning, and hopefully this was a little bit helpful to see the various combinations, you can then uh, derive any kind of scenario at all. All right, any more questions about this? Is it at least a little bit clear how these things work? Yeah, all right, okay. There are no more questions, that's, that's it.